All right. And welcome to Wednesday Night Bible Study here at Expedition Church of the Triad. So glad to have you with us tonight. And uh, we would like to uh, extend a uh, welcome as I silence my phone. Uh, I forget to do that every once in a while. Um, we'd like to extend you an invitation to join us here at Expedition Church. Uh, we are located at 6302 Walter Wright Road here in Pleasant Garden, North Carolina, 27313. We are 4.3 miles from Interstate 85 exit 124. That's the Elm Eugene exit off of Interstate 85. And 4.3 miles from there, we are here at uh, Expedition Church of the Triad. We are three miles north of NC 62 and Hunt Road Interchange. So if you're out on that side of the county and you come up to 62, hit Hunt Road, we're three miles up uh, from there. And um, we'd just love to have you join us and be with us. Praise the Lord. Um, if you've got your Bibles, go ahead, if you will, to the fourth chapter of the book of John. We're going to start teaching on the healings in the ministry of Jesus. Healings in the ministry of Jesus. And, uh, yeah, this is a subject we have covered before. But we're going to recover it for the uh, express purpose of teaching on miracles, teaching on healings, sharing about them in the Bible, um, inspires our faith, gives us vision to see what God does, what God has done, and what God will do. And um, actually, we're probably I'm going to segue in here somewhere with miracles of the Bible, go into the Old Testament and go over miracles in the Old Testament. Um, and instead of trying to we want to get them out of the Bible story mindset we may have. Where we, oh, that's a Bible story. You know, the three Hebrew children in the fiery furnace. And we kind of Bible story it without looking at it as the act of supernatural God doing supernatural miracle signs and wonders. And then the present day is still doing that same thing. Okay. So we want to build uh, an awareness and a faith and an expectation. Uh, I'm, I'm going to tell you something. Expectancy with God is everything. Okay. What, what it, you know, the word hope. Remember, remember uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. Well, what is hope? What is Bible hope? It is a supernatural expectancy. In other words, that God will do what he said in his word he'll do. What is faith? Faith takes hold of that expectancy and claims it as a reality. So uh, Brother Copeland preached, oh, 40 plus years ago, uh, had a tape series called Hope, the Blueprint of Faith. You see, if you've got faith but don't have hope, there's nothing to give substance to. So you have to have an expectancy. So by sharing uh, things like the healings in the ministry of Jesus, sharing miracles, then we develop an expectancy that that's what our God does. Amen? All right. So this will be more teaching or just sharing, um, and, and we'll, we'll allow the Holy Spirit to guide us into uh, different veins as we go down these healings. Now the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, um, were referred to as the Synoptic Gospels because they tell so much of the same stories from a different viewpoint. John's Gospel is not Synoptic because his is so different. He covers, so many, he covers things that the other three don't cover. And, um, but all in the end is pointing to Jesus as the Messiah. Amen. As the Son of God, the Messiah. Um, and so there are 31 recorded healings throughout the four Gospels. Of those 31, there are 19 different healings recorded. In other words, one healing might be recorded by three different writers. Okay, well, it's not a different healing. Same one told from a different viewpoint. Or shared some information is left out other information is added in between the between the accounts um, and we can glean from all of those and uh, and of the 19 12 give credit to the faith of the individual or individuals who received seven don't okay so um, we, we learn we learn a lot by the just those numbers okay the majority of people will be healed according to from the word of God by faith. But then there are the ones where people's faith is, you know, it, it, it ain't there. It's absent. It went AWOL. Or they never had it to start with. 
got it afterwards because all of a sudden now they got, they got, they got something from God. So anyway, uh, we'll start out with this one, the healing of the nobleman's son over in John chapter 4, looking down into verse 46, uh, um, okay? And it says here in verse 46, and then he, then he, and this is talking about Jesus, uh, when he was coming to Galilee, the Galileans received him, having seen all the things which he did at Jerusalem at the feast. For they also went up to the feast. So they had just come from uh, Jerusalem, saw the things that Jesus had done there. And when he showed up in their town, boy, they're ready for him to be there. They're excited. They're going to have a, you know, a town meeting. Amen. So when Jesus came into Cana of Galilee, uh, where he had made water into wine. Now, the word wine in the, New in the Bible, refers to both fermented and non-fermented grape juice. Okay? Fermented and non-fermented. Well, Jesus turned the water into fermented wine. Really? He took, and when they had well drunk, violated God's law against intoxication and got them drunker wine. Y'all got to sit there and think about that one for a little while, don't you? Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. And get them more intoxicated when God's Word prohibits it. Intoxication. Muse on that for a little while. Um, I, we had when some ministers were in Italy um, not too long ago, and they were talking to winemakers. Um, I'm sorry, France, winemakers. And they will share with them that the best tasting wine is right before it ferments alcoholically. These, these are these winemakers. That the be best taste is right before it ferments. And you save the best till last. I believe he made it right before it fermented, the best till last. Hallelujah. Amen. So. Anyway, you can go ahead and argue and send me Mickey Mouse emails and letters and texts, and I won't answer them. I just won't. Hallelujah. And uh, just don't blow up my own personal site with your stuff. I'll block you forever. Um, but see, he came to where he had made water into wine, and there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. And when he heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, he went unto him and besought him that he would come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. <coughs> and um, Jesus said, except you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. And the nobleman said unto him, Sir, come down, ere my child die. And Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy son liveth. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him, and he went his way. And as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Thy son liveth. And he inquired of them the hour which he began to amend. They said unto him, Yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. So the father knew it was the same hour in the which Jesus said unto him, Thy son liveth, and he himself believed in his whole house. And this is the second miracle Jesus did when he came out of Judea into Galilee. <clears throat> and so he believed, now listen, he's not rushing home. He's not scrambling to get home. It's next day. And he's, just, he's casually going home. Why? He believed. But here we have a miracle of Jesus speaking the word. That word spoken was received, and the, and the healing took place. Amen. Uh, Matthew chapter 8, let's look, look at Simon's mother-in-law, 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 mother-in-law. Now, Dick's always never remember that song. Oh, yeah. Uh, real quick, got to have a wife to have a mother-in-law. And if Peter's the first pope, then the first pope was married. How do you know? Because he had a mother-in-law. Just saying. There you go. 
Okay. Um, verse 14 of Matthew chapter 8. And when Jesus was coming to Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother laid and sick of a fever. Now, Peter's wife's mother. We call that the mother-in-law. But the Bible was, I guess we want to make sure that we understand that Petros was married. Not Petra, but Petros. I'm just having a little fun here, guys. Um, and he touched her hand, the fever left her, and she arose and ministered unto them. Amen. And then Mark's account of this, verse 30 of chapter 1, but Simon's mother was lay sick of a fever, and anon they tell him of her, and he came and took her by the hand, lifted her up, and immediately the fever left her, and she ministered unto them. And then Luke chapter 4 says, and he arose out of the synagogue and entered into Simon's house, and Simon's wife's mother was taken with a great fever, and they besought him for her. And he stood by uh, over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. And immediately uh, she arose and ministered to him. See, here by reading this, we get a different view. Because now Luke adds in, he rebuked the fever. The other he just touched her. But here we find that he actually spoke to it and took her hand. Amen. There's authority. I just had a discussion today at uh, work with a coworker because they said something about silent prayer. <clears throat> and uh, y'all know that's one of my pet peeves. And, um, and I said, and I, 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 I guess I, I, I found, I kind of felt bad later because I thought, you know, I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have done that. Kind of like jumped, you know, there's no such thing as silent prayer. He's, he's like, you don't believe? No. I said, no. I said, D even, he said, you don't pray, you pray out loud when you're by yourself? I said, yeah. I said, even if it's quietly, I still pray out loud because prayer is speaking. You know, our words have authority. Your thoughts don't have authority. And there's no way I could take him and teach him a whole Bible lesson right then on the spot. That's why I shouldn't have said anything. And I, and I feel bad about it because I really shouldn't have. I just, it happened. You just kind of hit, it struck that balloon and it popped and came out. Um, you know, maybe more. Maybe I picked up more things back there on those on that preaching anointing, uh, like the the uh, youthful boldness and brashness. Uh, may have to work on make sure that one didn't, don't cause me any trouble. Anyway, um, words have authority. Words have power. And, you know, the law of Genesis. I said the law of Genesis, and God said, and God said, and God said, words carry authority. Words carry power. Okay, and so Jesus came, stood over her. And rebuked the fever. Y'all you know, have all seen the movie. Probably the NBC plays, uh, used to play all the time at Easter, you know, Jesus of Nazareth or something like that. And they got the choir music in the background, you know, the, the traditional, the spooky music, you know. And they, Jesus, you don't see Jesus lay hands on people. They had the shadow of Jesus' hand going to the shadow of the person's head, being laid on it with all that music. And somehow that's supposed to be real spiritual or whatever. It's spooky. Okay? Now Jesus came in and rebuked the fever. He spoke to that fever and then laid and grabbed her by the hand and it left her. Then she got it. And she was healed. Boom. Got it ministered to her. Okay? So the first pope's wife's mother got healed, and I'm just I'm just being in jest now, and uh, you, you know because the the pope comes out they come, the whole thing comes out of Peter being the uh, line of secession, where Jesus said, uh, "Flesh and blood hadn't revealed this to thee, but my Father which is in heaven." I say unto thee, "Thou art Petros, but upon this Petra I'll build my church." And they don't distinguish between the two words because it doesn't fit the narrative that Peter was the first pope. Petros means stone, pebble. Petra means boulder. Okay? You're a, you're a pebble. You're, you're rocky. But on this rock, what? The rock of Revelation, not on Peter. Church was not built on Peter. It was built on Revelation. That Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. And we'll leave that alone. Healing of the leper, Matthew 8, verse uh, 2 through 4. So we'll just back up a little bit. <clears throat> Let's try verse 1. When he came down, when he was come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. And behold, there came a leper and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, 
Thou canst make me clean. Now, let's stop. And um, let's analyze this just a little bit. If thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. Now, that's King Jimmy, okay, for, Lord, I know you can heal me, but are you willing? And how much of our prayer in the church today is, Lord, heal so-and-so if it be thy will? See, we still, in, and that's, that is the problem. People don't know the will of God. Here this guy knew Jesus could. He'd heard the stories, apparently. Could have even been in the meetings where the people got healed. We don't know. Okay? And he comes to Jesus. I know you can. And I'll hear people say this. They'll get on the radio. We know the Lord can heal. But he doesn't always do it, or we just don't know if it's his will. Well, without faith, it's impossible to please him. And Bosworth said, then Brother Hagin picked it, and Brother Hagin carried it on saying it, that faith begins where the will of God's known. You can't preach a sermon on salvation and then give an altar call that goes, well, come on down here, this might be your day, you never know. It just might be the day the Lord saves you. There's no faith. No. And I, and I get mad. I remember, when I, I remember when the pastor preached that. It was on television. I'm thinking, you can't preach that. There's no faith. What do you preach? Today is the day of salvation. If you harden not in your heart. Amen. So when salvation, today's the day. Not come on down, you never know. Today's the day. Well, anyway, I thought y'all would be more excited than that. And he put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will. He didn't say, then he said, be thou clean. He didn't say, be thou clean, because I will. He said, I will be thou clean. Why? Because the problem with the guy was not knowing, not believing he could or had the power to do it. The problem was he, he didn't know if he was willing to use that power. And Jesus is willing to use that power. Amen. He's made that power available. All right. And, he, and then he said, and immediately his leprosy was clean. Go your way, tell no man, show the priest, and offer the gift of Moses for a testimony unto, unto them. Uh, Mark 1, there came a leper to him, beseeching him, kneeling down to him, and saying, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. Now, see, we get a little bit more in this one. And Jesus, moved with compassion, said, um, put forth his hand, touched him, and said, I will. See, the compassions of the Lord are new every morning. God is a compassionate God. Amen? Hallelujah. He doesn't hold out on people because he wants to barbecue them or teach them a lesson or withhold from them or prove that he's in charge. Hello. As soon as he had spoken, uh, the leprosy departed from him and he was clean. And then he straightly charged him. And uh, da, da, da. Matt, Luke 5. Came to pass a certain city, behold, a man full of leprosy, who seeing Jesus fell on his face, but saw him saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. He put forth his hand, touched him, saying, I will be thou clean. And the, immediately the leprosy departed from him. So we have, a, we have, an accurate, we have three accounts of the same thing. Uh, the only addition is, is in Mark's gospel, he said he was moved with compassion. The love of God moves him, moves him to minister life to us. We have not a high priest who cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. Amen? But was in every point tempted with, as we are yet without sin. Hallelujah. We have a faithful high priest. He watches over the covenant. He watches over his word to perform it. Amen? Hallelujah. And he's touched with the feeling of our infirmities. He's touched when people hurt. He's touched when people suffer. He's touched when people are in anguish. The love of God is great. 
And we need to stop preaching the angry God. Now listen, here's why, here's why I agree with the love narrative. We don't need to preach the angry God. We need to preach the God of love. But we don't need to preach the God of love doesn't care if you do wrong. See, that's we, we take it to the wrong place. No, the, the, the God of love has made provision to minister to all your spiritual, all your needs, spirit, soul, and body. To deliver your mind, to set your body free from uh, sickness and disease, and to save your spirit. That's what the love of God does. It's made provision. It doesn't tolerate and accept as normal what he abhors. So, we, we, and we, need, we need to keep that straight. But we come over here, we get over here on one side of this thing, we get on the judgment of God, and God's going to barbecue you, and God's, gonna, and we always, God's angry all the time. And then we come up with narratives like God put that on them to teach them a lesson. God gave them cancer to teach them a lesson. Amen. Now, age was the judgment of God. Now, you know, I don't know if the age was the judgment of God. I do know the Bible says that because men, people, uh, in Romans 3, men turn from the woman, the natural use of the woman, and burn their lust one towards another, working that which is unseemly, they received in their own bodies their just recompense of reward. In other words, God said don't do certain things because there will be results or, 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 or um, uh, consequences to that type of behavior. Hello. Doing those kind of things cause problems. Amen. Um, and we won't go into I mean, any more gross stuff. Okay. But you know where AIDS came from. It was through bestiality. Okay. Well, that's prohibited in the Bible. Should be prohibited in nature. Okay. But I'm guessing they got one of the initials on the LBGTQ plus thing now. Don't think I'm being whatever. It's already coming out there. It's already being written up. People are people are having relations with animals and being declared that's normal. It's normal. Okay. And uh, how did I get from there? Anyway. <clears throat> but God does love people. And so when we're always preaching God's everything, you know, you're always got sick, you know, it's the same question. That this is, it's an age old question. We missed it when Jesus answered it. Master, when he came to the blind, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Remember that? And I'm sure it's in here somewhere, but in my notes, I we will get to it. But we, if we don't get to it right now, we're going to get to it right now. And um, Jesus said, neither, uh, uh, but that the works of God should be done. I must work the works of him while it's light. Now, understanding Greek doesn't have punctuation marks like we did. We do. You have to take things in, in context. <clears throat> we put in there neither and then went on and said that it, the reason was because God made him that way so he, Jesus could come heal him. If you read it in the King James and read it in, your, in English Bibles, that's the way it's structured. And the Greek language is not structured like the English at all. You start reading a literal where, you know, and it's backwards and it's, you know, things are this over here and that, you know, and, you know, Okay. And so uh, it takes it takes it takes some effort to translate. So let's you know if you take it like this, neither. But while it's light, I must work the works of Him that sent me, and then He heals him. Now, end of story was guess what? He got healed. So even if your narrative is that you know God made it that way so He could get healed, He got healed. We're always getting people out here who never get anything because God has a reason nobody knows about. There is not a reason on the planet that um, you're ever going to find out. You're just going to suffer through this, and God's going to keep you from finding out what he's trying to teach you. That's not good. That's not a good God. I mean, we, we work in the school system, and our goal is to teach the kids what they need to succeed, not 
tell them um, we're punishing you with a zero until you learn your lesson. What is my lesson? I'm not going to tell you. Well, how can I ever do it? You'll figure it out. How am I going to figure it out? I don't know. Tough. All right. Um, healing the paralytic, Matthew 9, verse 2. <clears throat> now, this is, the, this is the good one. Um, I'm trying to remember, which one's the, let's, let's look in Matthew 9 and Mark 2. Sit, tell us the same story, okay? And I'm, I'm going to see if which one's maybe the better of the three because they're long. Yes, Luke. I like Luke's account a little bit better. Luke 5, 17 through 26. <coughs> she watched that. They, they, they can watch those. Yeah, yeah, she, she needs to she needs to come let the word get the word and let them take care of that. Um it came to they're 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 well capable. Okay. And it came to pass on a certain day, as he was teaching, that there were Pharisees and doctors of the law sitting out and I believe you read the other ones you find he's in Peter's house. Okay. There were Pharisees and doctors of the law uh, sitting by, which would come out of every town of Galilee and Jerusalem and Judea. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Underline that. And I'm just going to go ahead and let you in on a little secret. None of them get healed. But the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Yet none of them get healed. Let me ask you a question. Why would the power of the Lord be present to heal them if it wasn't God's design and desire to heal them? Well, he had a sovereign reason for not healing them. He did not. He sent his power to heal them. He had it present and available to heal them. Amen. And behold, men brought in a bed, a man which was taken with a palsy. And they sought by means to bring him in <coughs> and to lay him, this man, before Jesus. And when they could not find by what way they might bring him in the house because of the multitude, and this house is full of folk. So many people, you can't get in there. And the power of the Lord is present to heal them. And they couldn't get in. So they went up on the housetop and led him through the tiling, down through the tiling, with his couch into the midst before Jesus. They just ran up on the roof and ripped the roof off and lowered him down. And when he, that is Jesus, saw their faith, he said unto him, Man, thy sins are forgiven thee. Well, there you go. Just lost the crowd. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, who is this which speaketh blasphemous? Who can forgive sins but God alone? <coughs> but when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered, saying unto them, What reason ye in your hearts? Whether it is easier to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Rise up and walk. Wow. But that, but that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power upon earth to forgive sins. He saith to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, arise, take up thy couch, and go into thy house. And immediately he rose up before them, took up whereupon he lay, and departed to his own house, glorifying God. And they were all amazed, and they glorified God, and filled with fear, saying, we have seen strange things today. Idiots. I said idiots. They got so caught up with something that they missed the miracle that they could have had. Every one of them except the man let down through the roof. Now, why did Jesus say, and let me kind of clean that up from the King Jimmy. He said, 
He basically said this. I'm telling you something. It's just as easy to say your sins are forgiven as it is to say rise up and walk. And the reason is it's the same sacrifice that's bearing them. Jesus bore our sin. Jesus bore our sicknesses. Amen. But they and their religiosity, so religious, we speak of blasphemies. He said, I'm going to prove to you. Get up and walk. Now, what opened the door to all this? Faith. He saw their faith. See, they had faith that wouldn't be denied. There was a corporate faith there. The man, listen, the man on the bed, because he could say, you guys ain't taking me up there. I'm crippled. What do you think is going to happen if I fall? Hello? You kill me. You know, he could have said that. Take me home. I don't want to get up there. He could have said all that. But they, they just wouldn't be denied. Let him down in the middle. And Jesus equates the power of God to heal and the power of God to save as the same thing. And that's why we can preach the sermon, uh, Forgiveness and Healing, God's Double Cure. Amen. I got that title from Brother Hagin. Heard him say it a number of years ago, and I've preached it, you know. Bless the Lord, O my soul, all that's within me, and bless his holy name, forgetting not all of his benefits, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases. Amen. Who his own self, by our sins, in his own body, on the tree, 1 Peter 2, 24, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did him esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. Amen. By whose stripes we are healed. Isaiah 53. Amen. And so Jesus tells us there's no difference in getting people healed and getting them saved. It's the same power. Different application. Do you understand that? You understand what I'm saying? One that works in the realm, it works on your spirit. The other works on the body. Okay. All right. The impotent man. They saw their faith. Now let's back up. Let's not, let's not leave that quite yet. They're there from everywhere. These are lawyers and doctors and Pharisees. All these people. And you know what? God loves lawyers and doctors. He likes ambulance chasers. Well, you may not like them, but he loves them. Okay? He loves them. And he sent his power to heal them. And they didn't get it. It wasn't because he withheld it. See, that's the key. We automatically assume, because we say God's sovereign. He's the omnipotent God. He's all-powerful. He's sovereign, meaning he does what he wants to do no matter what. And that's just not true. Because he sets spiritual laws into operation. He doesn't violate his own law. And when he gave uh, authority to Adam as the under ruler of this world, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, after our kind. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and the fowl of the air and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the face of the earth. And when Buddy Harrison used to say, thank God we got authority over creeps. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. Um, he, he, he gave man dominion. Man gave that dominion to Satan at the fall. Hello? And so God doesn't withhold Remember what we said? Remember the, the scripture says this. Uh, How shall he who spared not his own son, not also with him, freely give us all things? Amen. That, you know, and what those things, those things that pertain to life and godliness. Freely give us all things. See, we get this idea God saves us and puts cancer on us to teach us something. The Holy Spirit's the teacher. The Word is His tool. Amen? 
That, well, that's one of the meanings of the word paraclete. Comforter, advocate, helper, strengthener, stand by, teacher, intercessor. Amen? He's our teacher. He shall, call, he shall bring all, when the comforter or the paraclete shall come, and really in this context, it's not comforter, it's teacher. He shall, he shall, he shall bring to your, your remembrance all things I've told you. So really in that context, um, the, the partial definition, one of the partial definitions of paraclete as teacher is really what he's talking about. The teacher's coming. Amen? People think you can't be taught unless you got cancer. I don't know that, but I can tell you, you can die. And a bunch of people have waiting to find, learn the lesson that they never learned. I know that steps on religious toes. I know that steps on religious thinking. Good. Because if you're ever going to walk in victory and power and authority and walk in the goodness and all the things of God, you're going to have to know who God is, who he really is. He's not the man upstairs. He's not the big guy. He's not sitting up there with a heavenly fly swatter waiting to splatter you all over the place the minute you mess up. Amen. He's got goodness and mercy. Hallelujah. And he loves you. And he wants to bring you into the fullness of his blessings. Now, it doesn't mean he wants you to sin and that he's all right with you sinning. God's not all right with sin. But he sure will wrap his arms of love around you and, and help you walk out of it and walk free from it and walk victoriously over it. Hallelujah. Amen. All right. Impotent man. John 5. And this, and this, after this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is in the Hebrew tongue called Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, of halt, uh, of uh, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. Okay? For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first after the troubling of the water stepped in was made whole of whatever disease he had. <clears throat> and a certain man was there and in an infirmity 30 and 8 years. And he, that's, and when Jesus saw him lie, he knew it had been a long time in that case. He said, will you be made whole? And the impotent man answered with excuses. Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. But while I am coming, another step down before me. And Jesus said, rise, take up thy bed and walk. And immediately the man was made whole, took up his bed and walked, and the same as day was on the Sabbath. Now, let's just uh, back up a little bit here. There's more to read, but we'll, let's go here. There's a teaching that people who don't believe in miracles, and it's the dumbest, because it came out of a Christian's mouth, one of the dumbest explanations I've ever heard in my life. And I've heard some dumb explanations of stuff. He's trying to explain away miracles. It was no big deal that the children of Israel crossed the Red Sea on dry land. It was only six inches deep there anyway. And an entire army, horses and all, drowned in it? Hey, dummy, you just can't come up with a bigger miracle than the first one. How do you drown an entire army, horses and all, in six inches of water? Dodo brain. But you know, when, when you're trying to do away with miracles, signs and wonders and be carnally minded, your brain just don't work right. Okay? So one of the things is here that there was a, <coughs> a spring a certain number of miles away that would occasionally bubble up into this pool, underground spring, and all the minerals <coughs> and stuff that came out of that spring is what healed the person that got in. But just one. If your toe got in there first, you got all the minerals. 
This water is now saturated with all these healing mirror and minerals and stuff. And your toe gets in first and it's like a sponge and sucks it all in. And it was whatever you were sick from. They got healed of whatever they were, they were sick from. And they taught this like it was the gospel truth. And you're thinking, step back and look at what you just said, stupid. If that isn't the most asinine thing I've ever heard. And by the way, it's not a cuss word. I remember the first time I heard Brother Hagin use it, I went, <gasps> and when I looked up the dictionary, it just means stupid or foolish. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, A-S-I-N-I-N-E. Okay. It was a, it was a work. It was actually, this is what we call um, working of miracles or, or gifts of healings. It was probably working of miracles. Working of miracles is as the spirit wills, and if it can be used totally random. We never knew when the water was going to be trouble. That's why they were all hanging out there, hoping that they would be ready. That, you know, I'm, I'm sure people got creative, had catapults mounted up so they could launch them into the air to land them in the water so they could get in first or whatever. I'm sure people came up with, you know, there's got to be people who got creative. I mean, because people get very creative. <clears throat> I just write that. I like, I like to envision the Bible the way we, way we think and way we live. You know, okay. All right, I can't get in there. All right, look, set me up a trigger. When I hit that, it launches me into the water. Can't you see it? And tough luck, buddy, because Leroy over here got his toe in first. Now you're just going to splatter, have him do a belly flop. All right. So Jesus doesn't come to him and go, why haven't you been healed yet? Sir, will you be healed? And he has an excuse. Because he's, he's, he has no faith. He's lost his hope. You know, he's maybe just hoping that everybody else is asleep when the water gets trouble and he can slip down there before somebody gets up, wakes up. Something. And Jesus said, rise, take up your bed and walk. And he was made whole. And um, now, <coughs> when Jesus does this, this is a gift of the whole, this is gifts of healings and operation. As the Spirit will, he didn't minister to anybody else up there. Now, he could have been, but the Spirit of God led him to minister to this one person. Why did the Spirit of God do it that way? Now, that we don't know. When gifts of the Spirit are manifestation, there is he wills. Okay? That's why I share with you in the beginning of this teaching that of the 12, seven say their faith made them whole. Or the 19, 12 of them say their faith made them whole. Why? Because if there's not a manifestation of the Spirit that moves as he wills, we're not left helpless. Our faith can make us whole. And the higher percentage get healed by their faith. So there's, you're not left helpless or hopeless. Amen. Jews said, therefore, said unto him that was cured, it's the Sabbath day. It's not lawful for you to carry your bed. Religious people tick me off. This guy, they've seen him on that porch his, for years struggling to get down to the water. And they're probably over there here on the sidelines taking bets. I wonder if Jeff's going to make it today. I don't know. You know, the last six times it happened, uh, somebody else beat him in. Maybe next time. They've seen him struggle. They see him try to get down there and see him walk, uh, crawl away or whatever. Every time disappointed because somebody else beat him in there. Jesus comes, heals him. And they come over. You're carrying your bed on the Sabbath. 
carrying your bed. You're up walking, carrying your bed. You, we've watched you for years struggle, impotent in your feet, can't walk. You're up walking, but we don't care because you're breaking the law. That's why religious people make you mad. And he said, he that made me whole, the same said to me, take up your bed and walk. So, I, guys, I don't care. I'm walking. Yes, indeed, and I'm talking about you. Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot who did that song. And they said, oh, now they were really mad. What man is it which said to you, take up your bed and walk? We're going to go get him. He got the guy healed, told him to get up and take up his bed and walk. And they're so mad about the fact he's carrying his bed on the Sabbath, they want to go get the guy who told him to take up the bed. Not go, not go thank the guy for bringing the healing power to him. They're going to do something about the fact that he told him to walk with the bed. And he that was healed wished not, now that's King Jimmy, for he didn't know who he was. Okay? For Jesus had conveyed himself away, a multitude to being in that place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple. Now, think about this. Where'd the man go? Now, his buddies were out trying to find the guy who did it so they can stone him. That's probably what they're doing because he broke the law. You know? They're ready for a stoning event. He's at the temple. You know, we think he's doing it at the temple. He's gone to thank God. He's gone to worship the Lord. He's gone to uh, give gratitude. He could have done all kinds. He could have gone down to, you know, some pub or something. Celebrated. Which is what the world does today. He went to the temple to thank God. And he said, Behold, thou art made whole sin no more, lest the worst thing come unto thee. And the man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus which had made him whole. And therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. What a bunch of idiots. You're talking about this is religion on steroids. They cannot see the goodness of God in manifestation to heal somebody who's been impotent in their feet maybe his whole life and watched him struggle in life because he can't get up and work, needing a miracle, and all they can think about is he told the guy to carry his bed after he got healed. Now, the guy went to the temple to praise God. They found out it was Jesus. They're taking counsel on how to kill him. Because he did that on the Sabbath. There are six days in which to come and be healed, but not on the Sabbath. Don't want to take you off. It ticks me off. Religious people tick me off. People get mad. People took Pentecostal preachers and tarred and feathered them and ran them out of town because they were having miracle signs and wonders, and they didn't want none of that stuff in their town. And we were playing softball. Um, where do old baseball players go? They go play softball. You play church league softball, industrial league, recreational league. Uh, if, you, you, if you really want to get serious, you can play U-Triple-S-A or something. Um, class A, Class B, C, D, and all that kind of stuff. Okay, different levels of, you know. And they take it serious. Oh, they take it serious. Whew. Anyway, we, we, our team, our church uh, got us uh, got into the church softball league, and um, we were terrible. We were terrible. I was the only one on there who had ba like ball experience. The rest of them were. It was hard. 
I'm thinking, man, I want to go back to the industrial league. I know, I know they're not saved, but they, they win. Because I had just come off of 500, of, uh, the batting champion for the team and all this kind of stuff, hit well over 500 that year, you know. Um, but and then I'm down over here on this team. They can't throw the ball. They don't know which way to run. Oh, yeah. Our outfield, except for me, and I'm not bragging on me, I was a good outfielder. I mean, I was a, I was a high school all-conference guy, you know. Um, had a really, really, really strong arm. And, um, you know, so when they were playing and uh, the center field was going after the ball and I cut it, I, I, I had a, an angle and I took it and threw it home. And uh, I said, uh, I did that because – he was, he was going to score, and I cut him off. Now, the, the third base coach wouldn't let the guy run. He said that the other – and my third baseman told me afterwards, said, the coach said that if the other guy had caught it, he was going to send him, but he wasn't going to let him run on you. That guy quit the team. That's how that, – because I didn't let him have, you know, his, equal, his equal chance at catching the ball. You know, it's church league. We came to win. Hello. Not at all costs, but we did come to win. I've seen you throw. You can't get it to, you can't get it to the second baseman 30 feet away. I can put it on the line to the catcher without without touching the ground and without throwing it like that. You know. Anyway. Sorry, I'm reminiscing here. Um, how, how come I got off on all that, Jerry? Religious folk. Yeah. So we're playing in that. There, there you go. Thank you. We're playing in that league that year, and one of our guys slid into second base and got hurt. Now, this is a church league. It means we're playing another church team. We are all supposedly Christians. But we're the charismatic word of faith, hand laying on, devil casting out, tongue talking bunch. So our guy slides and says, it gets hurt. So what do we do? We pray for him. And one of their players turned around and threw his hand and said, I ain't having nothing to do with that junk. And walked away furious called doing what the Bible says junk. Oh, yeah. Laying hands on him and praying for him. Called it junk. He ain't have nothing to do with that junk. Well, go ahead, stupid. What are you going to do when you're sick? And you're going to have nothing to do with that junk that the Bible says, if there's any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church. Who with the anointing of all in the prayer of faith shall, shall heal the sick. And if they've committed any sins, they'll be forgiven them. Yeah. You don't believe in that junk. See, religious people get mad over the power of God. But the people who receive from God go to the church and glorify God. Amen. And you can tell who you are by how you respond. If you're mad that people pray for the sick and they get healed, they're a bunch of gimmick preachers. You can't explain everything by being a gimmick preacher. I know, I know there's charlatans. There's charlatans in the churches that don't believe in anything. Hello. And I know they got on television a few years ago, and every time you turn on Christian television, they were selling some mineral drink that you could be healed from. Every one of them were doing it, you know, because it was a money maker. I'm thinking, turn that stupidity off and get start praying for the sick. I, I listen. I'm not against eating a good diet, but this was all snake oil stuff. We've come up with this mixture and that mixture and this mixture and. We're going to get you into an MLM, multi-level marketing, selling this product. And um, not only are you going to get people well from you know, drinking this mineral stuff, you're going to make money. 
He did not say go into all the world and preach mineral water. Are you here? Are y'all gone home? All right. Matthew 12. They say they took counsel to slay him because he healed somebody on the Sabbath. That's sick. You healed him on Sabbath, we kill you on Sabbath. I mean, it's right to kill him on the Sabbath. Think about it. They're, they're, they're probably walk more than the law allowed them to walk on the Sabbath. They're trying to find out who did it so they could go kill him. They're breaking the law trying to get rid of somebody who broke the law. But their self-righteous justification, they couldn't see it in their fur, their fur uh, uh, feverish pitch of stupidity. Matthew 12, verse 9. And when he was departed thence, he went to their synagogue. And behold, there was a man which had a wither, uh, hand withered. And here we go. Still in the Sabbath thing. And they asked him, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? That they might accuse him. They're hung up on this Sabbath thing. Hello. He should have said, was it lawful for you to read from the scriptures on the Sabbath? You're doing a good work on the Sabbath. And he said unto him, what man shall there be among you that shall have one sheep? And if it fall into a pit on the Sabbath day, will not lay hold on it and lift it out. How much better then is a man than a sheep? Wherefore, it is lawful to do well on the Sabbath days. Then saith he to the man, stretch forth thine hand. He stretched it forth, and it was restored whole like as the other. Then the Pharisees went out and held counsel against him how they might destroy him. They don't care this guy's got a withered hand. You've seen, you've seen people with withered hands. And it gets healed, made whole. And instead of rejoicing and glorifying God of this wondrous miracle, this man now has a, a, a healed hand. He's made, he's, he's made whole. He's not walking around uh, in, in, impaired. They're ready to go kill Jesus. Amen. Now, let's read Mark's gospel. And he entered into the synagogue, and there was a man that had a withered hand, he watched, and they watched him, whether he would heal on the Sabbath day, that they might accuse him. And he said uh, to the man with the withered hand, stand forth. He said, is it lawful to do good on Sabbath days or to do evil, to save life or to kill it? But they held their peace. They weren't going to, you know, listen, they're just like the political people of the day. They won't say anything because they don't want you to be able to hold them, hold them accountable. But they held the peace. And when he looked around about them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their hearts, he said, stretch forth thine hand. He stretched it forth out, and his hand was restored whole as the other. And the Pharisees went out and straightway took counsel with the Herodians against him how they might destroy him. Luke says, and they were filled with madness. And commune one by the other what they might do to Jesus. Wonder what spirit they were of. They were filled with madness. We have that in the church today. <coughs> Preachers are preached in the pulpits. That people who pray lay hands to sick and pray for them are of the devil. They're giving glory to God. They're speaking in the name of Jesus. They're honoring and praising God for the results. But they're of the devil. Kind of funny that Acts 10 38 says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power 
who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Hello? Now the church teaches in many places that if you're healing the sick, you're of the devil and that God put it on them. When Jesus was ministering, it was God who anointed it to get it off of them, and it was the devil who put it on them. I wonder who would be telling you that lie. Well, it ain't God because Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I am the Lord, and I change not. My compound covenant name of Jehovah Rapha is the Lord thy physician. Amen. And we're going to have to stop there. We're going to have to pick up next week with the centurion servant. I did not know that we went that far. We only covered six of them. See, I told you we start, we would, we would so get into stuff with them as we did them. Okay. Uh, it's just the way the Holy Spirit will do. We, I'm, I'm just taking these scriptures and he's bringing stuff out. Glory to God. Um, thank you all for joining us tonight. If you want to give, um, remember, uh, we're, we're still using the old church hashtags um, for giving. Uh, Cash app is dollar sign faith victory church without the word and we are expedition church of the triad. Uh, as I said, we are still waiting on paperwork back from the IRS that will allow us to change that with uh, cash app and with PayPal. Uh, we have sent them the um, certified documentation from the secretary of state that our name has been changed legally and permanently, but it, you know, the IRS doesn't do anything at the speed of anything above slow. Somewhere between slow and no. They're down in that, that range, okay? They're in no gear or slow gear. They're, they're never anything above that. Unless you owe them money with interest. And then they suddenly get really fast. Okay? But um, it is Faith Victory Church, dollar sign Faith Victory Church for your cash app. And it is donations at fbc.org for PayPal. Okay? All righty. Father, we thank you. And, and if you're in the house, there's, um, there's envelopes in front of you. Father, we thank you for the word of God. We thank you for your, your goodness and mercy. And we speak faith of the people as they give. And we thank you that it's received before the throne of God. Your, the word says that Jesus receives our tithe. And we thank you for it now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Brother Joseph, there's anybody in the house giving? Uh, go ahead and receive that. If you're giving online, go ahead and send that. Glory to God. Hallelujah. And uh, we just want to thank you, everybody, for being with us tonight. And um, we trust you will minister to this there, listen, we've covered six, there's 19, so we're going to be here a while. Okay? But that, does this inspire you? I mean, this is, this is the thing that I think, you know, we, we look at this, we go, yeah, you know what? That, that's, that, that builds our faith. This is what God does. Amen? Hallelujah. All right, don't forget Sunday morning, uh, Fifth Sunday Fellowship's coming up. Uh, with, with, we're, we're trying to pull off this harvest thing, guys. Uh, I really need, we really need some help to be able to do it. As I said the other day. Oh, anyway, all y'all watching on the internet, thank you for joining us tonight. God bless you. Remember these words from 1 John chapter 5 and verse 4, that whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. See you next time here at Expedition Church of the Triad. Until then, walk with God, be blessed. What you walk with and live in the this presence of the supernatural God in Jesus' name. Good night.